So this is the first week where we are actually going to give a full fully quantum mechanical treatment to physical systems. So up until now, everything we've been doing was uh, semi-classical, as in uh, we had some experimental results we were trying to explain, black body radiation, photoelectric effect, and the stability of a hydrogen atom. And the way all of this analysis proceeded was we are using classical mechanics. We were using what we felt familiar with, except for maybe one key step where you put in the, that quantum mechanical assumption, right? And now what we are going to do is we are going to see a fully quantum mechanical approach to a physical system so that you are kind of looking at things from the other end. Because here's the thing, classical mechanics, Newtonian physics that you are familiar with, that is not the correct description of the world. And you cannot describe the correct law, for, oh, sorry, you cannot derive the correct law of nature from the incorrect law of nature. It doesn't work that way. You can maybe guess at the correct law of nature um, <laughs> from whatever you get from Newtonian mechanics. But quantum mechanics, even though it's more complicated, more difficult to understand, it is actually more fundamental. So you can derive classical mechanics from quantum mechanics, but it doesn't work the other way. So, uh, so with the chapter seven, with what we are doing today, um, this week today is, well, uh, how do we describe something just uh, starting from quantum mechanics? And it's going to be very challenging thing. So we are only going to ever deal with the, the simplest possible pictures. But let me give you some uh, footing that actually footing that you have from last week. So let me, I guess I can write them down as uh, quantum mechanical assumptions. And you have seen each of these as we were going through the early quantum mechanics last week. And what I'm doing now is I'm carefully picking a few expressions that I can guarantee you in the fully quantum mechanical treatment will still be correct. So those are the relationships about energy is Planck's constant times frequency of, so this is the quantized energy of whatever it is you're dealing with. If you have a wave, then it comes in units of this much energy. Or if you have something, a particle that has some amount of energy, then you can associate a frequency with it. Even though it might be something like this ball that you never thought of it as vibrating before. Um, so uh, this is a bit too mysterious maybe. Uh, the expression I prefer to work with, and this is actually what we'll work with the rest of today, is momentum is given by h divided by wavelength. This is the de Broglie relationship, and this is, um, I use this in, um, well, not my physics tent. When I teach uh, conceptual physics, this is how I try to teach quantum mechanics conceptually. Because this has the advantage of each of the quantities here are somewhat easily understandable, right? Like momentum is easy enough, mass times velocity, and wavelength is easy enough to visualize, right? So, and this has the benefit of this is always correct. This is not uh, some approximation. This is uh, fundamental quantum mechanical uh, expression. And uh, while I'm writing down assumptions, let me write down the very last thing, which is that the, the angular momentum is quantized. So I guess I can write it this way. Change in angular momentum comes in, well, you know, actually, let me write it the other way. Because um, I think either way I'm gonna, so angular momentum, it comes in this unit of h bar. Or if you want some, want to describe some amount of angular momentum, it would be an integer times h bar. So this got introduced, uh, actually I guess these were the quantum mechanical leaps that each of those semi-classical approaches were taking. And uh, what I can tell you is that these assumptions themselves are right. You just have to put them in the correct context. 